Hey there, everybody. How's it going? Great to see you again. Thanks for coming out today. So um, I made the video yesterday and I always get a little nervous when I start getting philosophical and start talking about aesthetics and muses and passion and creativity and art. And, um, you know, it, it, the video with the comments that I've been reading seems to have resonated with a bunch of people and that's great. But uh, interestingly, there was one guy who uh, made a comment that um, I completely got the wrong end of the stick. Um, but it was a it was a thoughtful comment, and 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 um, you know I appreciate that. But uh, you know, so just to address that first, um, it's horse first, then cart. Okay, because I don't see a lot of horses pushing things. Usually, horses pull things, and that's just the natural order of of the way the world works and the way physics works. And so what am I talking about? Well, um, he, what he took away from my video yesterday was that the effort, money, and time that I spend doing large format photography is what makes it better or great. It, it's what makes my images great or better or more artistic. And that's the cart before the horse. That's not what I was saying. What I was saying in the video was that it's the time, the effort, and the money that I spend on large format photography that helps me make better art and makes me be more creative. Okay, there's a subtle distinction, but it's the other way around. I wasn't saying that the time, the effort, and the money is what makes the images great. It's the time, the effort, and the money that makes great images. Not every time, but you, you get the point, right? Okay. It's a subtle distinction, maybe. A lot of, most people got it. He turned it around the, the wrong way. So, um, so that led me, uh, so I've been thinking about it overnight, and that led me to the idea and, and I need to clarify something else. As much as I have a passion for film, and as much as I love film, and as much as I enjoy shooting film, 95% um, of my work is digital, okay? So like only 5% of the time do I shoot film. That might be, I mean, I'm making that up. So it might be 80, 20, or the point that I'm trying to make is the majority of the work that I do is digital, all right? And so, um, and that, but it also, and I'll reiterate this, it's why I keep coming back to the Fujis because they're the most transparent or film-like digital cameras that, that, that I've used, okay? I love shooting with the X-T5 because of the dials and, and all that. So, um, X-T5 on the, on the um, Thomas Eaton tripod and uh, the uh, exercise for today which I thought would be a, a real learning experience if you're just starting out in digital photography, whatever, or photography in general. Um, this would be a great video, but also, I hope it'll be a great video, but also from the standpoint of, what if I approach my X-T5 as if it's a large format eight by 10 view cam? What, what if I went through the motions of making all the decisions and all the motions and all the actions and all the things I have to do, the most critical path for taking a photograph with the X-T5. Like, like the, the thing about the eight by 10, the thing about large format film is it, is it eliminates all the superfluousness and all the automation and all the ridiculousness. And you get down to the absolute essential things that are required. You need film, you need to focus, you need to uh, have a steady tripod. Okay, you, you know, it, the, it's the basics. And you gotta, and it really forces you to cross off all those boxes as best you can. And so the thing is, is what if I approach my X-T5 from that standpoint, okay? Well, first of all, um, I'm lens limited. On the, on the 8x10, um, the lenses that I would employ, and pretty much the only lenses that are the easiest to use, um, uh, without, like when you get to the extremes, an extreme is like 
and I'm going to use 35 millimeter focal lengths here. So the extremes would be like lower than 30 millimeter and higher than 80 millimeter. Okay, so um, my 240 would be like a 30 35, and my 300 is like a 45. And um, if I get, the, when I get the uh, Nikkor 450, that's going to be like a 65 millimeter lens. So clearly my 16 to 55 28 Fuji lens, that far exceeds whatever focal lengths I'd have in 8x10. Now 4x5 is a little bit better. I think with 4x5 I go to 28 to 100. But my Fuji kit with three lenses goes from 15 millimeter in full frame equivalents goes from 15 millimeters to 450 millimeters, which is absolutely like amazing from a, from a large format view camera perspective. As a matter of fact, I think a 450 millimeter focal length is impossible on an eight by 10. So um, at least I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's an equivalent to that. It'd be uh, whatever. So. Um, Okay, so the first, uh, so it's all about the choices, right? And so the first choice you have to make is what film am I using? Well, I'm gonna splurge and I'm gonna use 125 speed Fuji, let's go with Provia, okay? So let's use 125 speed Fuji Provia. So I'm gonna dial that in. Got to lower the camera so I can see it. So 125 ISO Fuji Provia. Now, to be more 4x5 or 8x10 like, I'm also going to dial in a four by five aspect ratio. And I'm, and that's one of the other things that's really cool about these new Fujis is they'll give you, you can shoot a, four, a five by four, they call it, a four by five aspect ratio and still get the full raw. So, and I'm gonna make sure that I'm shooting raw plus JPEG. So that was film selection. I've got um, ISO 125 and I chose a four by five aspect ratio and I chose, um, Fuji Provia. So that's film choice done. Now it's on to composition. So that would be the equivalent of loading the film holders. Well, the first thing I always do is I level my view camera. I see this as a horizontal, so I'll rotate the film back. Gotta love the Fuji flippy outy screen. All right, I need to be careful because I don't want to exceed my focal length requirements, although I might. Well, that's interesting. I got 35 millimeter, which is about 50. So yeah, that falls within the range of my uh, 300 millimeter on my eight by 10. So I'll call that good. Um, the next thing that I would do once I got my composition uh, set is I would uh, now work on the focus. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So when I was establishing that composition, I set my screen to have no information on it. It was just purely the image. That helps too. So the next step is uh, focusing. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to switch to uh, manual, and then I'm going to pick my aperture, which is gonna be F11. Okay, and that shows me the depth of field on the little blue bar there is uh, there, and that's if I focus. Another cool thing about the Fujis is when you're in manual focus, if you hit AF on, they'll focus. Not every digital camera does that. Okay, so this is telling me that my depth of field, if you see it here, isn't quite at infinity. So there we see that bar move. I want to kind of focus. So the lower tree limbs are about more than 10 feet away. So that's good. They're probably about 15. So I can move this to about there. And that depth of field indicator 
is really helping me out. I'm going to set my focus about there. And so there's focus, and that's at F11. Now, if we go F13, all right, let's do that. And it gets us a little bit more in focus. Yep, that's zoom, wrong, wrong, wrong dial. There we go, that's about what I want there for focus. I mean, I don't know whether it's right or wrong. I don't know if it's all gonna be in focus, but if this was a view camera, that's the best I would get also. So we'll find out when we get there. Now, as for metering, the matrix metering on the X-T5 is telling me that at a 30th of a second, um, this is uh, at F13, that's where I wanna be. But um, I, I'm not going to, I mean, that would be the quick and easy way to do it. And the histogram is showing me that's, that's not bad. I might want to, well, it's jumping around because the sun's coming out. I might want to underexpose this a little bit more. Go maybe F14. That's probably where I would shoot it. So, um, but I'm not going to take that for granted. Um, now, notice up here, that's pretty dark. And so um, with a film, I would use a, a split neutral density filter. Uh, well, because this is digital, I can bring it into uh, Capture One and just use a graduated filter. And I also have 13, 14 stops of dynamic range, which film doesn't have either. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go get my Sekonic spot meter and spot meter this and see how it uh, compares to the in-camera meter. Um, this is going to be interesting because I've never really done this before. And I've heard different things like, oh, you know, digital cameras, the ISO is different than film and this, that, and the other thing. And, um, uh, oh, the Fuji's uh, rate ISO differently than anyone. I mean, ISO is ISO. It's an objective standard. At least that's the way it works in my head. And so uh, you take a $600 Sekonic spot meter and uh, bring that out. And let's see how um, it compares to what the Fuji meter is giving me. This'll, this should be interesting. All right, got the old Sekonic out, dialed in F14, ISO 125. First, let's take an incident reading. So we'll take an incident reading. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, the Sekonic $600 spot meter in an incident reading mode is giving me a 25th of a second at F14 at ISO 125. The uh, Fuji matrix metering in my Fuji X-T5 is bang on at a 25th of a second at F14 at ISO 125. So all this nonsense about Fuji rates ISO differently than anyone else and, and um, uh, digital ISO is different than film ISO. ISO is ISO is ISO. End of story. Um, I, I, I knew that was going to happen, but, but, I, but I had to prove it to myself, okay? And so uh, there it is. You can believe it or not. I mean, all right, so that was interesting. Uh, now let's uh, do some uh, spot metering and do some zone system extrapolation and see what I come up with. Um, I'm, I, hopefully I won't be biased because I already know that incident's giving me 25th of a second, you know, but we'll, let's see what happens. All right, brightest highlight. Commit that to memory, darkest shadow, Ooh, that's tough. Try right there. All right, so brightest highlight. So brightest highlight is the ripple in the water. Darkest shadow is under the rock. <laughs> so if I use the method where I take the brightest highlight and the darkest shadow, and then I average those two out, I get a 20th of a second at F14, ISO 125. So a 20th of a second versus a 25th of a second. So what does this tell you? This tells you the matrix meter in the Fuji camera for this scene is spot on, literally. All right, fascinating, let's take the shot. So this is the point where I'd pull the dark cloth off the top of my head and I'd get some film and I'd put it in the camera. 
and then I'd test my shutter, and then I'd put a cable release in, etc., etc. But in order to do this, because I have a little bit of uh, automation here, which I'm actually going to use, I'm going to use the two-second self-timer for camera shake, and uh, that's it. Okay, so one thing that my view camera won't do for me is show me the photograph after I've taken it. I have to wait until I process the film and hope for the best. Um, but um, one of the things that I might say to myself uh, while I was out here with my view camera is, you know, a 25th of a second isn't really enough to blur the water like I would like. So I might need a uh, neutral density filter. Although on the view camera, I'd be shooting like F64 on the 8x10 and F45 or 32 on the 4x5. So that would lower my shutter speed to about a second or you know half a second or something, which is where I want to be. But on the uh, X-T5, there's a difference. I would need a uh, neutral density filter. Three stop, two, four stop would probably work. So I'm going to go get that. You know, and thinking about it, uh, using a little bit of uh, polarization might help too. The first thing I do to, when I whip out the polarizer is I just take it and I look through it and spin it a little bit and see if it uh, makes a difference. And it does. So let's put some polarization on. These are all 77 millimeter filters that I adapt, although I don't have to adapt to this lens because this is a 77 millimeter lens. How cool is that? Now, with my 4x5 or 8x10, I'd have to put the dark cloth on again and look through it and all the rest of it. Here, I can just turn it on and look at the viewfinder while I spin the filter. There we go. Now that dropped my exposure down to uh, 2.5 um, a little bit more than half, like a quarter of a second. So let's take that shot. Okay, I really like that. The polarizer was all I needed, and polarizers usually drop you one or two, three stops, depending upon how much polarization you get. So really cool, nice shot. Sun came out, bumped my exposure up. Third of a second. Not bad. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm really pleased with that shot. And, um, Compositionally, hey, it is what it is, okay? This is really just a, just a, 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 you know, a practicing of the craft. But interestingly, uh, I feel, okay, that I've made the most out of that composition that I could artistically with my knowledge and my skill. So approaching my Fuji X-T5 with a view camera mentality gives you that sense of satisfaction and that feeling of accomplishment, okay? I, I, this may not be the greatest photograph in the world, and I don't even think I would hang it on my wall, although I gotta get it into the computer, maybe print it out to see. But I'll tell you right now, I've got that satisfaction that I personally have put as much as I can into the photograph in the creative process. So it's totally possible with a digital camera. It just requires an extreme amount of self-discipline. And it also requires you to take the time. So what did we learn on the show today, boys and girls? Well, number one, that if you approach your digital and take the time and change your mindset, it, it can be rewarding and it can be a fun experience, okay? But you have to have the time. And um, where the real benefit is, is that when the sun's going down and you've got 30 seconds to take the shot, bang it on aperture priority and off you go. And yeah, you can get, you can roll up and get the shot. But 
But the problem is, is when you're trying to be creative, you know, uh, making the most out of it and putting the mo as much of yourself into the photograph as you can, you really need to slow down, take your time, and be creative, okay? And that's the lesson. The other lesson is, is that ISO is ISO, and the matrix meter in a Fuji X-T5 is as good as a $600 Siconic dedicated spot meter. Uh, that's actually really impressive, to be honest with you. I, I didn't think the Fuji meter would be that good, but it, ha it has been extremely reliable, so I've been happy with it. So there it is. Hey, thanks for coming out. Um, hopefully this video clarifies a little bit more of where my head's at in terms of what I'm thinking in terms of digital versus film, etc. And remember, you know, this is my journey. This is my path. I only share it because um, maybe it helps uh, other people think about these topics and think about, you know, what they want to get out of photography and why they enjoy photography. So a little bit of a long winded video today. Um, I appreciate you coming out and uh, glad to get out of the office and it's supposed to rain for the next week. So I just wanted to enjoy this weather while I could. Although I might go out in the rain, it's going to be a warm rain. They're saying like 60, 65 degrees. So that might make it worth going out because uh, rain photography is always interesting photography, even if it's difficult photography. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. I really appreciate it. Have a great one, and we'll see you out here. Bye.